Hello, I am Glenn Hall and today is May 10th, 2023. Uh, the name of this video is Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I think this video is going to, going to be a little bit longer than usual. There's quite a few things that I need to uh, talk about today. <clears throat> I'm going to start with an interesting verse uh, from Matthew 13. Matthew 13 is the uh, epitome of uh, parables, the parables of Jesus. And toward the very end of this chapter, he says this to his disciples. He says, have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. Of course they didn't, but um, that's, what we, that's what we do, isn't it? And Jesus said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. I'm going to start today by uh, sharing something old. Um, I was just picked up a, a notebook of mine uh, yesterday. Looks like that. And uh, I read a very interesting dream that I had in September of 2018. <clears throat> but then I, uh, I'm going to share that, but I also want to share something I wrote in the same notebook a year earlier. It was September 2017. And... This is a poem I wrote called Answered Prayer. I prayed my ears would open and that my blind eyes would see. I prayed to know you better and that your spirit would fill me. Then I looked down at the waters, saw waves darken, moving in. I wondered at what I saw. Then I said, it is the wind. And I knew that you had answered though I could not see your face. God is here, I said aloud. Yes, God is in this place. The wind continued blowing, soothing my poor soul. My mind began to clear as your spirit made me whole. I came, I asked for water. You sent a stream to me instead. Now I bask in living water as my home and as my bed. I had evidently gone on a day trip, and uh, when I came home, I shared this with my wife, and um, I wrote this. Just as God sent the wind to me and gave me the above poem, he was also answering my wife's prayers as she worked her garden. We both agreed that God speaks to us differently than to the recognized church prophets. He does not speak to us directly or allow us to see him. God speaks to us very subtly. He has trained us to, quote, be not like the horse who needs to be turned, and I added these words, by direct revelation. But in the psalm it says, who needs to be directed by bit and bridle. So God is training us to respond to the subtle moving of the Spirit, the subtle wind of the Spirit. That reminded me of John chapter 3 that I'll read, verses 1 through 8. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Amen, Amen, or truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Amen, Amen, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, 
he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So I read that poem I had written, and then there was another poem I wrote two days later. And this is, remember, this is the fall. This is uh, beginning of autumn. It was written on September 6, 2017. This poem is called The Changes. You can feel the changes if you let yourself. You can see yellow where you used to see green. And now you notice the red, the telltale sign of autumn. And you can feel the changes in your soul if you think about it. You're not the same man you used to be. That's a good thing, too. I'm looking for the new man, made in the image of him who created me. I'm looking for my new soul, patterned after Christ. Yes, I can feel the changes. Well, and then, one year later, almost exactly a year later, dream and I've had a dream of this person the dreams of this person at least 20 times I, w I won't name him but he is a very very well known Christian uh, person just woke up at 6.30 a.m. And last dream of the night was a dream of a man I've known for a long time. One of 20 or more I have had of him over my life. I've not seen him since the year 2000 and never watched his teaching videos. My wife and I were sitting in a row at a long table at his newest church. He suddenly appeared about 20 feet in front of us. We said hi, and he seemed to smile in a soulless recollection of us. Then he went forward a bit and began to speak to the whole church. He began by saying, why do I live full time here at R2D2? Or something like that that sounded like it was something electronic. Then he began to say more that he evidently thought to be spiritual. My wife and I looked at each other as if to say, what kind of nonsense is this? Then a professional sounding electric guitar player started playing music. He was standing right next to this man that we have known since before our marriage. And he, the guitar player, is playing dovetailed with his talking. We said we should leave, but did not want to be obvious, so we continued sitting. Then he walked down the aisle to our table, stopped, looked at us, and turned his head a bit sideways and smiled as if to say, aren't I cute? But said nothing. He looked young, like we remember him. But his hair was a, about four inches longer and kind of stuck out in a hippie way. He also seemed to have bleach blonde hair. End of the dream. And here's the really fascinating thing that I wrote after that, I said impression. So my impression. Our old friend, and remember he is now a preeminent uh, Christian figure. 
in the world. Our old friend appeared to be part of an artificial intelligence future, and he fully embraced it. Nothing was left of his original spiritual power and magnetism. And then I wrote this question. Had he taken the mark of the beast? You can't imagine how sad that makes me. That was 2018. That was before COVID-19. That was before the forced jab. That was before we knew that they were placing electronics into the jabs and before we knew that they were putting those into us through the chemtrails that fall daily in the skies, through our water, and even in our food, that they add hydrogel and graphene to our food. There are three women that I want you to take note of and at least become acquainted with their research. Dr. Anna Mihalsha, M-I-H-A-L-C-E-A. She's both an MD and a PhD. She has seen these electronic components in blood samples that she's looked at in a microscope, under a microscope. Another researcher who has looked into the patents of these things is Karen Kingston, K-I-N-G-S-T-O-N. And then there's another researcher that does deep dives into these patents and explains what they're doing. And I recently, well, her name first is Celeste Solem, C-E-L-E-S-T-E-S-O-L-U-M. I recently watched a video of hers, and uh, I'll put a link to that here. She says that the powers that be have moved up their schedule, and now they plan to have this whole thing completed of merging man with machine by the year 2025. That's just two years away. Well, that pretty much fits what I uh, have been expecting. I believe Trump will be reelected in 2024, take office in 2025, and immediately he will uh, mandate the mark of the beast. But can you imagine how... Uh, Interesting it was for me to read this dream I had five years ago and then read my impression where this Christian leader evidently had taken the mark of the beast. And by the way, I, I recently did a series of videos on uh, the unforgivable sin, the uh, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and said that I believe that this group, uh, there's many, many people who call themselves apostles and prophets who are part of this uh, loose organization called New Apostolic Reformation. This particular person is a very key figure in that movement. Another thing I want to talk about before I get into the subject of this video put on the Lord Jesus Christ is a recent word I got from prophetess Christine Beadsworth. 
And I got this Monday, just two days ago, and it's called The Furnace of Waiting. I plan to put a link to that here too so you can read it. But Christine uh, agrees with me and my wife that we are in a, a waiting pattern right now that is trying our souls, purging us, purging the dross from us, from our souls. We are in a fiery furnace. If God does not act, we all die. No question. They control everything. The food we eat, the gas and electricity we use to heat our homes, everything. They control everything and they are poisoning us and attempting to merge us with the machine. Now this is the final kingdom, the final beast kingdom that Daniel prophesied, interpreted from Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2. The toes of iron and clay, but iron and clay won't mix. So this kingdom will fail. We know it will fail, but Jesus said, if God did not shorten the days, no flesh would be left alive. That's how serious the situation is. And it's still amazing to me that it seems that almost no one gets it because people still are talking about patriot rallies and supporting this candidate and call your senator and your representative so that this happens or this doesn't happen. Don't waste your time. Everything is sewn up. Christians are not going to usher in the kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus will have to manifest in thousands that have submitted to him who want to be made in his image. That has to happen or no flesh will be left alive. Now I've been teaching from the book of Revelation and uh, we've actually gone through the first five chapters of Revelation, and I have taught at length from several of the other chapters, especially 17, 18, 19, sometimes, well, 20, of course, 20, the Lake of Fire, 21 and 22, dealing with New Jerusalem, uh, 12, dealing with the manifestation of the sons of God, 13, dealing with the beast that rises from the sea and the beast that rises from the earth. So I've, I have taught very much of the book of Revelation. But there are still many, many things that I do not understand about the book of Revelation. So... At least at this time, I'm not planning to go through the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls of wrath uh, in detail. But I will say something that might help you to understand it a little better. In Ezekiel chapter 1, Verses 15 and 16, he says, Ezekiel says, he's watching the cherubim. As I watched the four creatures, I saw something that looked like a wheel on the ground beside each of the four-faced creatures. This is what the wheels looked like. They were identical wheels, sparkling like diamonds in the sun. It looked like they were wheels within wheels. 
like a gyroscope, wheels within wheels. Well, that's what I see now as I read the seals, the trumpets, the bowls of wrath. And I'm going to go down to the sixth seal in chapter 6 of Revelation. When Jesus, who was revealed as the Lamb, opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Earthquakes can speak of huge changes of government. There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island were removed from its place. So mountains certainly are governments, islands evidently the same, smaller governments probably, removed from their place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, everyone. But it's specifically mentioning all of the great ones and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Hid themselves in the remnants of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? I think the seals show us in, in just very short pictures the entire history of this age from the death of Christ and resurrection of Christ until this time we live in now. And that in the sixth seal, it moves to this time of the wrath of God. Well, it's very interesting to look at the other six sixth things, like the sixth trumpet, Revelation chapter 9. Now the fifth angel blew, that's the beginning, that's the first woe. But then, verse 13, the sixth angel blows, and this is the second woe. Verse 13. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. That is 200 million. 200 million troops. Then John says, I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur, and the heads of the horses were like lion's heads. And fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. Second time, it says, a third of mankind. Well, that's at least two billion people at this point. More than that, evidently. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshipping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. 
Well, we see that, don't we? That even in the midst of the incredible afflictions that have come upon the world in the last three years, men are not repenting at all. They're flaunting it, dressing up like Satan in their Grammy Awards, sicken, sickening. There is no repentance. Well, now let's move to Revelation 16 to the sixth bowl of wrath. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now go back to Revelation 9. Verse 14 says, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Isn't that interesting? Wheels within wheels. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Now we're in Revelation 16. And its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Okay, now, remember in Revelation 9, you had 200 million being prepared to cause the death of a third of the population of the world. Now, are you paying any attention to what's going on over in Ukraine and Russia? And how Russia is uh, getting very close with China? Do you remember how the United States obliterated Iraq, which is the area of the Euphrates River? How we constantly remain at war with Iran, right next door to that. That's the ancient Persian Empire. Do you think maybe the U.S. and Europe are provoking the East? You think? Maybe. Could it be that we're watching this unfold before us right now? I think so. We are at the end. Things are never, ever going back to what we thought was normal. This system is coming down, and that's exactly what God planned. This is God's doing. This is God's plan. So we need to remember that. Even though we see evildoers doing evil deeds, and indeed they are. God has allowed it. God had angels placed for the particular hour on the particular day of the particular month of the particular year to release the 200,000 warriors to destroy a third of mankind. Revelation 16, 13. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Now, if you want to know who these players are, go back and read Revelation 12 and 13. The dragon is revealed in Revelation 12. The beast that rises from the sea looks just like the dragon in Revelation 13, 1. And then later on in Revelation 13, the beast that rises from the earth, the false prophet, the one who looks like a lamb but speaks like a dragon. That's him, the false prophet. That's them, people like the new apostolic reformation apostles and prophets. And there are many more. Because most of the churches are corrupt. The charismatic churches are represented by these guys. And it's just one false thing after another, one false prophecy after another, false doctrine after another. 
So John sees coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Then verse 15, which is so strange, Jesus suddenly breaks in and says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. That's all he says. Then verse 16 ends the sixth bowl, and it says, And they assembled them, that is the unclean spirits, Assemble them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Armageddon is the battle for our mind. That's what all of this is about. They want to merge our minds with artificial intelligence, and they want to control our minds. They want to take away our ability to worship God, to love God, to do what's right and true and force us to do only what they want us to do. This is the battle of the mind. We're in the midst of it. And it's in the midst of it that Jesus says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. How do you keep from being naked? Do you remember the admonition to the church in Laodicea? He says to them, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. How do we clothe ourselves? How do we get these white garments? Romans 13, verse 11. Now here, Paul suddenly breaks into the prophetic. Romans 13, 11 through 14. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we, when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. The night is far gone. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling, not in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That's how we clothe ourselves. Wow, easy to say, huh? Let's go to more scriptures so we can learn how to do that. Galatians chapter 3.
Verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Well, that's the question, isn't it? Have we been baptized into Christ? Most of us will say, yeah, I was baptized, you know. When I was nine years old, I went through confirmation classes. Um, when I was 21, I um, was saved and I got baptized. When I was a baby, an infant in my church, I was baptized. Is that what Paul's talking about? Have you been baptized into Christ? It's a baptism of fire. It's the application of the Word of God to your life. See, we make, the church made all these simple doctrines so everybody could feel like they did it. Let's go to Ephesians 4. Verse 17. Ephesians 4, 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the nations do in the futility of their minds. That's how people walk, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. That is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old man. Put off your old man. Stop doing the deeds of darkness, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new man, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Put on the new man. What's that? That's Jesus. Put on Jesus Christ. That's what Paul teaches. Put on the new man. Well, how do you do that? It's called the obedience of faith. You begin to obey to the best of your abilities because you now have faith in the one who was God in the flesh, the example of righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits 
the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Now we need to learn to take that word and turn it around. Let no corrupting talk come into your ears, but only such as is good for building you up and to give you grace. So if you're watching things, if you're listening to things that are filled with corruption, you need to stop. We should not even look upon evil things. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. How many people hold on to hurts and never forgive? It's unbelievable, the unforgiveness that you see. Chapter 5. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among the saints, or the kodeshim, the holy ones. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. How many of you tell crude jokes? They're out of place, but instead let, them be, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, which means he is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Well, that's what's coming. That's what has come. The wrath of God is here. That's why it came. Because all the, practically all the earth is disobedient. Therefore do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. It is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. This refers to uh, getting drunk with alcohol and getting drunk with false doctrine. Both lead to debauchery. Be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Oh, by the way, getting drunk with wine would include getting high on dope as well, drugs, A lot of people are on psychotic drugs. A lot, probably many, many, well, I know many, many Christians are on things like Valium and other things that it's not even called that anymore. But um, they have created drugs that literally keep you from making moral judgments. Do not get drunk with wine. Do not get drunk with drugs. Do not get drunk with false doctrine, as we saw with the prophets of Ephraim in Isaiah 28. For that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence 
for Christ, submitting to one another, not submitting to the pastor and doing everything the pastor says, you know, and always going to the pastor for your daily bread. You have to learn to feed yourself. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, set her apart, making her holy, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. That's how Christ cleanses the church. That's how he cleanses you. How he cleanses me is by washing us with his word. That's what he did to the disciples when he washed their feet. So that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So here, Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 2. And then he says this, This mystery is profound. What mystery? Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What's a mystery about that? Well, who is the man? This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Christ became a man. Christ left his mother and father and became a man. He is loving the church, loving the individuals who will allow him to wash them so that he can become one with them, one flesh with them. Remember, I think it was the last teaching I did on Revelation 4 and 5 where I talked about how you really could not distinguish between the Father and the Lamb, the Father and the Son. And remember Jesus and his promise to the overcomers One of the promises was that you will sit with me on my throne just as I sat with my father on his throne. How can two people sit on one throne unless you are one? And that's the point. That's the mystery. And that's where the church will not go. The church will not go there. They will not teach you. That the goal is that you are to become perfect just as Jesus is perfect. You are to become one. That's why he washes you with his word. This is how we put on Christ. That's what we're reading right now. All of these instructions that Paul gives in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. All deal with putting on Christ. Let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Then chapter 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Now he's actually talking about slaves here. 
not by the way of eye service or people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. We are bond servants of Christ because he paid the price to redeem us from Satan's kingdom. Doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Now, if you are free, then you have an obligation not to obey unrighteous commands. Are you putting hydrogel, graphene, other things into our food? Are you spraying chemtrails? You have an obligation to stop, quit your job, expect God to provide you with something else. You have an obligation. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We are in a spiritual battle. We are in the battle for the earth, and we cannot prevail in the natural. This is a spiritual battle. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Truth equates to justice and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Okay, justice and righteousness are the foundation of God's throne, the foundation of his rule. These are the first two things Paul mentions. That's why we need to wash ourselves with the word so that we know what is truth, so we know what is righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, the good news of Jesus Christ. Put on Jesus Christ. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation Be renewed in your mind. Stand in faith. Don't give in to fear. That's how we extinguish the darts from Satan. And take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Know the Word of God. Wash yourselves with the Word so that you can speak the Word to others and to yourself as you need it. Praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the Kodeshim, all the holy ones, and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. And then... Let's go to um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. So, how do we put on the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Things like these. So that's a long list, but... Not everything. 
There's so many sins. You know what's, you know, when you're walking in the flesh. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. We are in tribulation. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. In the midst of the horrendous tribulation of the onslaught of the kings from the east, of the 200 million forces. Jesus appears and gives us a warning. Let's look at that again. Very short. Revelation 16, verse 15. Right in the midst of this preparation, this assembling for the battle of Armageddon, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. We will not go about naked as long as we continue to put on Jesus Christ. 